everyone, and welcome to the 2020 Virtual Power of Women. I'm Jane Rotter, the Power of Women Advisor and the Director of Leadership Giving at Kingswood Oxford School. Today, we are KO Strong, with more than 170 students, parents, faculty, and alumni zooming in. We are so excited to introduce you to our dynamic panelists. But first, I want to thank all of those who made this event possible, including our parent executive committee members, Meryl Bronstein, Karen Diaz, Elaine Lesham, Meryl Mandel, and Ngozi Ta. Next, our Power of Women Student Board and Committee, who now make up the largest student-run organization on campus. Today, you will hear from our two amazing student co-chairs, Sloan Duval and Risha Ranjan, who will MC our conversation. But first, it is my pleasure to introduce to you our head of school, Tom Dillo. Thank you, Jane, and, and welcome everybody. Uh, we have a powerhouse of a lineup today, and we're so grateful for these panelists uh, that are taking their time to share their thoughts on leadership. Um, what an incredible coincidence, what splendid serendipity it is uh, that we're hosting this event, uh, one that's about empowering young women, one day after the people of the United States elected Kamala Harris to become the first woman, the first black woman, the first woman of Indian heritage as vice president of the United States of America, the second highest seat of power in the strongest, most powerful nation in the world. KO has been developing young women to go out into the world and make an impact and lead for over a century now. And when I think about our own young women, our student leaders at KO today, in both the middle and the upper school, who have shown such strength and resilience, despite the many challenges this year has brought, I'm so hopeful that they're inspired by the words of our, of our panelists today, um, by the example of Mary Martin, the founder of our school 111 years ago, and by the words of our new vice president-elect, uh, that last night when she said, while she may be the first woman in this office, she won't be the last, and that every girl watching her speech last night can see that this is a country of possibilities. I will not be surprised to see some of our own young KO women following in her footsteps one day. So before we get started, I just wanted to take a moment to, for a few thank yous. First to uh, all of the students that were involved in this. Um, it was a large group and it took a ton of organizing, um, but congratulations and thank you to the student committee, uh, to our two co-chairs, uh, Sloan Duval and Risha Ranjan. You know, we could not be doing this without you. Again, I wanna thank our incredible panelists for being here, but I think a special thanks goes out to Jane Rotter. Um, the Power of Women event is her brainchild, and without her, it would not exist. So let's give uh, virtual thanks, high fives, claps to Jane Rotter. Thank you, Jane. I hope that today's conversation between our panelists and all of you will help to inspire our students to grow further in their leadership capacity, that they'll be willing to take risks and feel empowered to pursue their dreams. So without further ado, let me hand the program over to our two incredible student leaders, Sloan and Risha. Take it away. Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Risha. And my name is Sloan. And we are both Form 6 students at Kingswood Oxford. We are also the senior co-chairs of Power of Women. KO Power of Women works to connect women in the KO community with students to, to develop an authentic and engaging dialogue around the issues of women's leadership and empowerment. Today, we're going to be facilitating a conversation with four remarkable women from the KO community. First, we'll pose some questions our student committee helped us curate. We invite the other panelists to join in on the conversation. We encourage all of you to use the Q&A feature to ask questions throughout. Make sure to put your name and your connection to KO if you'd like. Even though this is a webinar, we want it to be as interactive as possible. Before we start, we also want to disclaim that our panelists are speaking on behalf of their own personal opinions, not speaking in the capacity of their employers. Without further ado, we would love our panelists to introduce themselves to everyone. Please say your name, occupation, connection to KO, and what your power is. Take it away, Erica. Hello, everybody. It is such a pleasure to be here uh, back at Kingswood virtually. And thank you, Jane, Risha, and Sloan. Uh, for the opportunity. Um, what an amazing time to be at KO. And I can't think of anyone who embodies the power of women 
better than Kamala Harris. Uh, so we've got you know, great timing on your part. Um, when I was at, at Kingswood, uh, I was a total bookworm. I loved le learning about history, about other cultures, um, and I made sure to take uh, Doc Saro's uh, political science class. That's kind of where it all started. Um, and that got me really excited about international relations and political philosophy. And I took that to Georgetown University School of Foreign Service for undergrad um, and learned a lot about the Foreign Service there. And it really ignited my, my passion for international relations. Um, and I also started working at the communications office in Georgetown, which then led me to a master's degree from Tufts University in international communications. So putting those two together, um, I then started at the uh, United States uh, Department of State as a presidential management fellow uh, doing public diplomacy and international communication. Uh, and a few years later, I joined the diplomatic corps as a foreign service officer. So as a foreign service officer, uh, I have represented the US overseas in the embassies in Brazil and India, and most recently at the US mission to the European Union in Belgium. And next year, uh, I'm going to be at the US consulate in Adana, Turkey as the public affairs officer, uh, explaining US policy values and culture to people in Turkey. Um, so hopefully uh, I'll be able to do events like this uh, with, you know, with, in Turkey as a, as a public affairs officer and uh, also do, do in-person events once the you know, coronavirus is over. Um, so I'm really excited to be here uh, as, as Vice President-elect Kamala Harris has said, Women are powerful, and my power is my adaptability. Now passing it over to Nicole. Hi everyone, um, it's great to be here. Thanks so much for, for having me, and thanks to the panelists, or to the, to the organizers for setting up such a great event um, in these you know strange times. Um, it's great to be here with everyone. Um, I graduated from KO in 2012, um, and while I was a KO student, uh, I was involved in a lot of things on campus, but I think the things that set me um, kind of most directly on my path to the work that I do now um, was uh, my time uh, as a member um, of Forensic Union and uh, my involvement with debate, as well as my work on the KO News, um, and as well as the the science classes I took, particularly Mr. Goodman's biology class, which um, was probably one of my favorite classes that I took in high school. Um, and after KO, I attended Bowdoin College for undergrad where I studied neuroscience. Um, but I usually say that my main major was my work for the student paper, the Bowdoin Rant, um, which I edited my senior year. Um, and after finishing college, I moved to New York City to um, attend NYU's Science Health and Environmental Reporting Program, which is a master's program specific specifically focused on science journalism. Um, and after that, I uh, kind of jumped right into work as a health and science reporter, so which is I've been doing for the past few years. Um, I spent a few years as a freelancer, um, so I was pretty much self-employed working for a number of publications, um, including Popular Science, Gizmodo, Slate, Wall Street Journal, Consumer Reports, um, big range about a lot of different topics. Um, and for about the past year, I've been the health technology reporter at The Verge, which is a science and technology focused publication. Um, I was hired to cover health technology. So, um, you know, the algorithms that uh, make up a lot of our healthcare system, um, things like how the Apple Watch is moving into the health space, um, although that got a little bit derailed by um, the COVID pandemic. So I've been focusing a lot on um, writing about um, coronavirus and COVID um, for the past six months or so, um, although things have slowly started to move back to um, the, the health tech side as well. Um, so again, really excited to be here. Thank you so much for having me and I'll pass it over to Ngozi. Thanks, Nicole, and thanks, Jane and Sloan and Risha and the rest of the committee members for having me here. Uh, my name is Ngozi Taff. I am the mother of a current KO student and also a recent KO grad. I am a three-time UConn alumni. I, breathe, I, I, I live and breathe UConn, uh, which is where I currently work. Um, I work in the Office of Global Affairs. 
as the Assistant Vice President of Global Affairs. And in Global Affairs, we work to uh, promote international scholarship. We do that by way of encouraging our students to study abroad and also international students to come to the university and study at the university as well. Um, in addition to that, we promote international scholarship, um, international research, and promote global partnerships. So a lot of work really goes into that in terms of improving the dialogue um, with the global environment. Um, but very importantly, um, the Office of um, the Human Rights Institute sits in the Office of Global Affairs. Um, and with the Human Rights Institute, uh, we strive to educate our scholars and our community with regards to informed understanding on, on human rights um, issues, which as you know, is very important today. Um, as a researcher, I um, study factors that enable persistence among minority groups. Um, that's something that's really near and dear to my heart. Um, and with regards to my power, uh, my power is my ability to engage with a diverse group of people. And I'll turn it over to Julia. Thank you, Ngozi. And thank you, John, uh, excuse me, Jane Sloan and Risha. It's really been a pleasure to get to know all of you and reconnect with the KO community. I am a 1982 graduate, so that was some time ago, but KO is a bit of a family tradition. My father graduated in 1951, and I feel today is a good day to share my story about how I was five years old at a Kingswood football game with my dad talking to then head of school, Robert Leisure, and I said, I'm going to go to Kingswood. And he smiled and looked down at me and said, oh, I'm so sorry, but Kingswood is just for boys. I said, oh no, I'm going. And of course, Kingswood and Oxford merged uh, just a few years before I started seventh grade. And then my cousin Kathleen, who I know is watching today, she was the class of 1984. So I'm really excited to be here with all of you today. Doc Saro not only inspired Erica, she also inspired me. I too studied uh, political science undergrad. I went on to get a master's in international relations with Boston University located in Paris. I had studied in Dublin for my junior year abroad. And then I went on to live in Hong Kong for a little bit before I called New York City home. And for the past 20 years, I've been working in residential real estate, working with people who buy and sell their homes, but also working with developers where I help them plan from taking a piece of land that's just an empty plot and then figuring out how to build a building and what it should look like. And what's so fascinating about that is how we change, or excuse me, how we live changes all the time. And it's certainly changing now with COVID. So very interesting times to be living in. My superpower is my ability to listen. And I always like to say, I have the ability to listen to what you're saying, but I have the ability to listen to what you're not saying. That means that I can help people better understand what their goals are when they're trying to buy and sell residential real estate, helping them be that much more successful. So much to all of our panelists. Uh, my first question goes to Julia. What unique obstacles have you felt have been put in your path as a woman? Well, you know, when my career began, um, it, was, it was quite some time ago. And the, the world is a different place, quite honestly. I'll never forget being 26 years old and very proud of myself, getting myself to New York City, getting set up, doing my networking through my alumni groups and getting a very, very impressive interview uh, with a gentleman whose name is on the side of a prominent business school. And I sat down and he asked me why I wasn't a wife. Can you imagine? Can you imagine that happening today? Um, and, and it made me second guess myself, like, well, maybe I don't have what it takes uh, to have a successful career. And I think the takeaway that all of you should have is that, you know, no matter who you're talking to, there's always going to be doubters, but you have to dig deep and ask yourself, what do I want? What am I capable of? And then just sort of blast through those barriers, whether they be real or imagined. Amazing. Thank you for sharing that. Um, Nicole, I want to hear from you. What is the best or the worst piece of advice you've ever received? You can answer both or one or the other. Yeah, I think um, the first thing that comes to mind would be worst advice I've received, um, which I think has sort of the flip side of, of having positive, you know, figuring out what the positive side of that is. But, um, 
you know, it's sort of anytime anyone has ever told me to stick with something that I knew wasn't right. Um, I think that there's an impulse, you know, when you're younger and ambitious and want to, you know, pursue big things that you have to kind of take all the opportunities that are presented to you and kind of throw yourself into them. And that's great. Um, but I think as I moved through school and got older, it became really important to develop a sense of, okay, what, what is the right thing and what is not the right thing? Um, and I've been in situations where I, you know, had a freelance job where I um, wasn't getting what I wanted out of it and was not being treated super well by supervisors or, um, you know, even just club participations in college, something as small as that, where, you know, I felt um, like it wasn't quite right, wasn't quite working out, it wasn't going to be kind of a good thing for me. But, um, you know, you have people telling you, well, just stick with it, just stick it out, things like that. And persevering and sticking to things that um, are difficult is really important. Um, but it's also really important to recognize when sticking with something is not going to actually like be a good thing for you. Um, and like learning when the right time is to ignore the advice to just kind of push through and um, when it's time to kind of put your foot down in situations like that um, has been kind of really valuable to me over the past few years. So. If I can just piggyback off of that. Um, similarly, I think women are sometimes told not to make waves, to just let something go. And if something is truly wrong or truly unfair, make the waves. Um, if you, you know, if you let it go, it's, it's not going to change. And the only way it changes is if you use your voice. Um, you know, there was, there was a time where a colleague of mine wasn't getting opportunities because she had a young child at home and that was not fair. And a group of us got together and said, look, you know, you need to, you need to distribute these opportunities fairly and let it fall on us, whether or not we accept them. Um, because it was being just assumed at a higher level that you know, my colleague wasn't going to want to take the opportunities. Um, so sometimes you do need to rock the boat and sometimes you need to, you need to stand up. Thank yeah. you, um, Erica and Nicole. And going back to what Nicole was saying, um, talking about setbacks and how you can push past those. Um, I'm thinking about myself and, um, you know, recently I figured out the STEM field, probably not for me um, after a few struggles on some physics tests. But um, I'm wondering, can Ngozi, can you think of a setback in your education, whether that be, you know, in high school or beyond that seemed like a failure at the time, but has turned out to kind of point you in the right direction or become a success for you? Sure thing, Sloan. Um, so like you, um, originally when I went into UConn for my undergraduate, I went in as a pre-med student. I wanted to do medicine. My brother's a doctor and, you know, um, I really look up to my brother. So um, I started off, you know, engaged very seriously in, in pre-med work and I was doing research, which as you can see, you know, 20 years later, I'm back to doing research, but it really wasn't my passion. And um, I, was only do I wasn't doing it for the right reasons. And so after my sophomore year, you know, I really had to take a step back to figure out what I really wanted to do. And so I switched to IT, which is very different from, you know, the sciences, you know, still technical, but very different from the sciences. And let me tell you, it was a very, very hard decision. Um, it was even harder having to have that conversation with my parents. Um, I can tell you that the, the conversation didn't go very well. Um, and um, I know my mom wasn't happy with me at the time, but um, you know, I think we all, you know, after we calmed down, um, it was the right thing for me. And um, I went on to you know, um, major in IT. I spent 22 years you know, of my um, career in IT, did very well, loved it. But, you know, the one thing with life is that every once in a while, you know, while we still have to, we can swerve. And so after spending several years in IT, I went back and got a doctorate in education policy. And now I'm back to doing research, which I absolutely love. And so the point is, you really have to get in touch with yourself and figure out what's best for you. But beyond that, you know, know that our life is, we have a very long life and a very long career. 
And at any time, you could always switch. You know, we can always do things for a few years, you know, for maybe a decade or two, and also do something else. You know, nothing says we have to stick to what we originally planned to do. Yeah, I mean, I think Erica, Nicole, and Ngozi, you've all talked about kind of standing up for yourself in, in different situations. Julia, could you tell us a situation where you've had to sort of use your voice and stand up for yourself? Yeah, you know, um, New York City real estate isn't exactly a gentle pursuit. Um, I have been referred to as the nicest shark in the tank. Um, so, yeah, we have plenty of opportunities to stand up for um, ourselves. It was actually an interesting um, situation in 2017. I was in a business situation where um, someone was trying to get rid of me on a piece of business where I deserve to be there. And I learned to speak up for myself and I learned how to fight fairly and to just stick to the facts and be 10 times more aggressive than I've ever been before. And once I got through that fight and I won that fight, I was never scared to speak up again. So finding your voice and learning how to fight it's incredibly powerful. Um, and I, I'd ask that same question to Nicole. I mean, in a in a STEM field, which is kind of notoriously not as uh, well represented by women, have you had a situation like that in your career? I think it's hard probably to pinpoint a specific situation. I've been really lucky to um, have a lot of really incredible female colleagues and, and mentors and editors and bosses um, in science journalism, which... Um, there are actually, you'd be surprised how many women kind of work in science and health reporting. I think it was a little bit surprising to me when I first entered the fields, um, but it is, you know, pretty good. There are a lot of women doing this work. Um, but I think that for me, the one thing that that stands out is when you see, um, you know, media is sort of a small world. You kind of people know what's going on, like who's got what job, like what's going on behind the scenes, things like that. Um, and I think the thing that sort of stands out is you notice who's getting opportunities, who's getting second chances and who's not, um, and who is getting kind of a lift to pursue a big feature article for a big publication and who's not. And um, who, you know, would get a second chance after something, you know, maybe didn't go so well or things like that. And, you know, obviously that doesn't just have to do with gender. It's, you know, very intersectional as well. Things like race and ethnicity, you know, as a white woman, I'm going to have more opportunities than women of color and in situations like that as well. And that's something that I think in media in particular is a huge part of that conversation around where the opportunities are, um, are and who they're made available to. So I think um, for me, it's just um, always been important to, um, to notice that when it's happening, um, and, you know, see the situations where people are um, not gatekeeping in the way that I think is um, bad for the industry, um, because it is, you know, bad for the industry when people aren't all getting kind of opportunities and, you know, the voices that you're not hearing and things like that. Um, so I would say those are that's kind of the, the main way that that presents itself um, in the work that I do right now. So I'm just going to add very quickly to um, the current dialogue. Um, so we all have goals and um, things we want to do, and nothing in that piece is um, easy. It's always challenging. And so you'll, you'll meet bumps along the way. But I think individually, we have to figure out what we want to do and if it's what we want to do. And so there are many paths to get to your goal. And so as you're going through life and as you're trying to achieve your goals, if you hit a bump, you know, you can always go around it, under it, over it, but there's a way to get through it. And so don't let any one person or any one thing or any one course prevent you from, doing your, from achieving your ultimate goal. If you wanted to do STEM, if you wanted to do any particular job, figure out, and, and this particular way you're headed down is not, um, it's, it's, it's challenging to get through, figure it out a different way. There are always people to help you. There are always people who will be willing to assist in some way, but go under, go over, find a way to get to your ultimate goal. I'd like to add a little bit to that. One of the things I was reflecting on is that when you're in school, it's a very linear process. You go from one grade to the next, you had the birthdays. And then when you, once you're out of school, you have this plan in your head of how things should go and you expect a linear path. And what we're all saying is once you get out into the world and you have a career, sometimes it's not linear at all. Sometimes you make hairpin 
curve turns. Sometimes you're thrown curveballs and you can't let that make you feel like you're not successful because those are actually the times when you're building up the skills and the self-knowledge that will propel your career forward. When you're able to take on that adversity and to recognize there's no linear straight path to the top of your career, you're going to be more resilient. So we've gotten this really great question in the Q&A from Gabby Rubin, who is who graduated in, in 2018. So she was a senior when I was a sophomore. Um, and she asks, um, have you ever experienced sexist pushback from women in your career? If so, have, how have you navigated conversations around that obstacle? So you guys can take a second to think about it. But. I'll take a stab at it. Um, I think that um, I'm going to lump this into the group of challenges in your career. I think, you know, when you go to work and you meet different people, it's important to understand that everyone is struggling in some way and everyone has some level of insecurities, et cetera. So it's not surprising to meet women or other people who may oppose or act in ways that are, I'll just say, unsavory. Um, but I think the goal is to stay focused on what your goal is, um, you know, remember why you're there and um, try to form other alliances with people who are for you. And, and in situations where, you know, um, you may be, you know, the, the lone man standing, you know, stay focused on your goal and get through it. And frankly, you know, in situations where um, you find yourself in an environment that might be toxic, you know, there is, you know, there's something to be said about one persisting, but also knowing when, it's time to find something else or walk away or find a different um, space that's much more conducive to what you want to do. Um, I think that there's a fine line between, you know, the stick to witness and pushing through, but also figuring out if a particular environment is just not for you for certain reasons and knowing the time to stay and the time to, to walk away. And I'll just add to that. Um, we have to remember that men and women are being brought up and in, in the same and are living in the same society so all of those societal expectations um you know there are there are women who have those same expectations for how other women should behave um and i think there's there's this perception that you know it, it's 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 just men who have this unconscious bias but we all have unconscious bias and i think you know, we're becoming much more attuned to it. So if you, you know, if you point it out to a, a, another woman that she's showing her unconscious bias, she might know what you're talking about. Um, whereas I'm not sure a man, a man would still. Um, but I, I think it's just part of part of the workplace still, and we have we have a ways to go until um, you know to, to smooth those out and. and you just like Ngozi said, you, you have to push forward and you have to maintain, you know, be true to yourself and maintain your goals, um, even, you know, even when others might be standing in your way. I also think it, you know, says a lot about how uh, inequality um, and uh, those sorts of issues are, you know, systems, um, and they're not necessarily rooted in individual action. And a lot of times when you're looking for the root causes of inequities or injustice or imbalances and things like that, you have to look to the system. Um, and, you know, individual, like fixing individuals is, or, you know, getting through to individuals or having individuals who are, you know, acting in certain ways is one thing, but a lot of this is just like baked into a lot of the systems that we all live in and work in, um, part like particularly in workplaces. Um, and so I think that a lot of times when there's an instinct to look to, to individual people and like, oh, if we just make these people like feel differently or act differently, it will fix the problem. Um, when really you have to kind of be more thoughtful about interrogated, like where those things are actually coming from. And often you find them in the systems and power, not in necessarily just the people themselves, although the two are interlinked. I'd love to add a little bit to that because that question caught me off guard. And as I'm listening to my other panelists and I realize I'm blessed to be in a company with a culture 
that is very different. Um, it was um, at the Corcoran Group. It was founded by Barbara Corcoran, which I'm sure many of you know her from the Shark Tank. And she just created this company where everybody supports each other. I mean, we work together in this notoriously cutthroat industry. We have a collaborative environment. So something that you want to look for as you're looking in your career is what company has a culture where I feel comfortable or reflects my values, because that will be as important as whether or not they want to hire you. Do you want to work there? Um, thank you so much. That was kind of a surprise question for you all. Um, but uh, kind of to switch, switch it up here, um, we heard Mr. Dillo speak a bunch about um, Vice President-elect Kamala Harris, and, you know, that makes me think of my role models and is a woman who aspires to hold public office. She's definitely someone I look to and am, you know, amazed by. So I would ask um, I'll start with Erica. Has there been someone who's you've really looked up to, a mentor, a role model, maybe that you know personally, or um, a figure who you've really uh, drawn inspiration from? So, I mean, first of all, today, like I think all of the all of the women here, I would love to say Kamala Harris because I'm just so excited. Um, but when I was in college, um, there, you know, that wasn't. That wasn't even on the radar. Um, and the I think the woman I kind of looked to in that in that way was uh, Madeleine Albright as the first female secretary of state. And she taught at Georgetown and I got to take her class. Um, and that was amazing. And it showed me what was possible and it showed me that representation matters. Um, so, you know, I'm, I'm super excited that, that girls now have even new role models, uh, to look up to. Um, and then the second part of your question on, on mentorship is super important, um, because not everybody gets to take Secretary Albright's class. Um, but along the way, there are, there are people, um, who, who can guide you, you know, as, as you move along. Uh, towards a career. And I know I had those people um, at Kingswood as well. A lot of them uh, were teachers and administrators who you know, get to know them outside of class because they're really, really interesting people. And they had a life before KO and they can help you. Um, and uh, you know, same thing at Georgetown. Like I, I got to know some of my professors outside of class and they connected me with internships and um, there are people, you know, throughout from, from previous jobs that I can call up and ask for advice. Um, it, it is, it's important to kind of cultivate that relationship so that when you have an issue, you have someone you trust that you can ask. Jumping on the mentor thing or the, the, yeah, the mentor thing, I would just highlight the, you know, as well as having mentors who are people who are further along in their career. Um, it's also has been huge for me having, you know, that, I, it's weird to call them a mentor, but those sorts of relationships with your friends and colleagues who are on kind of a similar level and progressing through their career at the same time that you are. Um, I've learned, I think I've learned the most from, from those people in my life um, because you're able to support each other. People are going through the same thing. And, um, you know, a, a really kind of concrete example of the benefits of stuff like that is, you know, when I was a freelance reporter, everything I did was um, for the most part, individual assignments. So I would, you know, get a story assignment for publication, have an individual rate for that story, um, and then, you know, get paid piecemeal for each story that I wrote. And one of the benefits of a network of peers is, okay, I'm getting offered this much money from this outlet. Have you worked for them? How much did they offer you? Did you, like, how much did you negotiate for? What did the contract look like? What was that process like? And that sort of information sharing was incredibly valuable. Um, for that part of my career. Um, so, and I think it's really important to um, not see people who are in the same position, same level as you as, as competition. Um, there's, you know, it, it, you're, you're gonna get much more out of learning from each other than, than competing um, in, in, in most situations. So I have to say, I agree with Nicole. Um, I have a, national network of agents that I stay in touch with because I'm, have I mentioned I'm in a competitive market? Um, so 
I don't necessarily want to be sharing my uh, marketing secrets with somebody who's working in New York City, but I might collaborate with somebody who's in Arizona or a colleague who's in just a different part of New York State. And I too have found that having that network has really been incredible and have helped me a lot. I've learned a lot that way. So I guess my next question, um, I'm going to ask Erica, what has been sort of the most rewarding part of your career as a foreign service officer? Um, I think the most rewarding part has been a sense of purpose um, and a sense of you know, serving other people, serving Americans abroad, um, because I think you, you see the U.S. through, through their eyes um, and you really appreciate the freedoms we have, the, uh, the values we have, and, and being able to share that with other countries. Um, I also really appreciate learning from other countries and, and hearing from um, the people that I, I work with and I meet. Um, it's, um, I think it's just very, very enriching. Um, and I love doing things like this and explaining, you know, what the heck a foreign service officer is um, and, and, you know, what U.S. embassies do um, to, to groups like you guys. So thank you. Thank you for that opportunity. And I'd like to open that up to anybody um, to answer kind of what is the most uh, rewarding part of your careers? I'll jump in. At the end of the day, what I do is help people. Every single day, all day, I'm helping people. And I'm helping people with what is probably the largest purchase or sale they'll ever make. Um, so there's a lot of mistakes you can make that can cost you time and they can cost you money. And I really love getting to know people, helping them figure out what they really want as opposed to what they think they want and then finding the best match and buying and selling Real estate is actually very, very complicated. And there's a lot of resources online, but when you actually get into a transaction, that's not sufficient. You need somebody who has the experience and the network to unwind, which inevitably will be a knot somewhere along the line. And it really makes me happy to help people and help them not lose time, not lose money and get what they want when they need it. So um, I'll jump in here. So for me, um, in the first half of my career, um, being in IT, um, I really derived a lot of joy from solving what I thought was, you know, complex problems. And so um, we did software implementations and um, implementing enterprise software is very complex, it's very challenging. You spend sometimes 24 months on a particular project, sometimes more. Um, and so you know, there was a thrill with um, solving these very complex issues and be having a successful um, implementation and being able to deal with all of that and long hours, long nights, etc. cetera. Um, so that was good. And while it lasted, it was great, um, but it was very tasking at the same time. Um, now on the other end, um, being on the student side, um, I just love that I am part of um, the global discourse and um, global conversation and being able to encourage um, global scholarship students studying abroad, other students coming to the U.S. and international research. That just gives me so much joy. That's a form of service. Um, I like that I can also um, impact um, research and also figuring out ways to help students like us, you know, women, uh, persist through college and um, being able to engage in that research and offer those solutions again just gives me so much joy. Thank you, um, Ngozi. And for for our next question, um, we we've talked a bit about this about setbacks and pushing through, um, but I'm wondering, Erica, maybe I know Julia shared a moment um, where she really felt um, some inequity when she was asked, "Are you a wife?" Is there um, a moment? where you really felt like this is wrong, I'm not being treated the right way. And did you have a response to that? I know um, 
I'll share one. One time when I was playing in a squash tournament, I dropped my racket and I got yelled at and I was told you cannot drop your racket, can't throw your racket. And on the court next to me, the boys squash teams, they had broken rackets from hitting against the wall and they didn't get yelled at. So I'm wondering, can you think of a time where you really felt like you weren't being treated fairly and you stood up for yourself? Yes. (laughs) Yes. <laughs> and I think um, a lot of us have, have moments like that because of kind of the double standard that I was talking about before. I mean, women have to be twice as good to be taken just as seriously. Um, and one particular um, example from, from recently, this was only like one or two years ago. I was in, in Brussels um, preparing for a visit by the president, I was in charge of a pre- setting up a press conference. Um, and one of the, uh, the head of Secret Service who was uh, there early, they, they usually come about a week early to organize things. Um, I was in a meeting with him and he completely, you know, blazed over me, didn't even see that I was there because he assumed I was the intern. So, you know, when it came time to talk about, you know, the, the logistics for the press conference, I inserted myself and I said, I'm actually the one in charge here. I'm actually the one who has been talking with our counterparts and, and setting up, you know, the, the, all of the equipment and setting up the, the, the schedule. Um, I have the expertise and this is why you should listen to me. And, you know, once, once I set that straight, you know, we work together fine, but I, I can't think of a man who has to overcome that initial presumption that you're not the expert in the room, that you're not, you know, in a leadership position. Um, so it takes, you know, it, it takes a little bit of, uh, of gumption to stand up for yourself. And, you know, Sloan, as you, you know, you pointed out, there, people take how women react in, you know, in a different way than they take how men react. Um, so when standing up for yourself, you're also coming up against that double bind. Um, so it's, it's still something that we're working through. I think it's getting better. Um, you know, when, when the Secret Service is going to be protecting Madam Vice President, I don't think they're going to be assuming that the women in the room don't belong. Do any of you have any similar stories like that? Yeah, I, I can jump in. Uh, unfortunately, you know, this experience is one that's all too often seen by um, women and minorities in general. Um, um, typically, when I walk into rooms or meetings, I'm usually the only woman there and only minority there. Um, and um, being that there aren't a lot of minorities in a particular space, it's easy to, you can see how people can make assumptions that um, you're not, um, you know, the, the leader in the room or, or, you, or you have a lesser position. Um, not to excuse it, but, you know, these things happen. And this is why um, it's important that we have an open mind and we have, um, we understand that the landscape is changing from where it was 40 years ago. And so when we engage in um, meetings or engage in any kind of discussions, you know, to be very mindful of the people in the room and expect that when we walk into rooms, there are women who will hold certain positions, there are minorities who will hold certain positions, et cetera. But yes, I've also been in that situation where, you know, someone assumed that was, you know, you know, I was the admin or, you know, I wasn't, you know, um, I'm not the IT person. Oh my gosh, a black woman doing IT or a black woman in global affairs. Um, but honestly, you know, you know, you, it, it happens, you move forward and um, you, you, you know, you, you remember that you come with, you know, what people call, you know, your, you know, your resume, you know, you, you have, you know, <laughs> you have backing, you know, and so you push forward. You know, these are things, unfortunately, that we have to walk through. Um, but um, to Erica's point, you know, with people like Kamala Harris and others, you know, Madeleine Albright and there Hillary Clinton, Michelle Obama. I mean, there are so many women out there who, who have earned their stripes, who are out there, you know, doing what they need to do. And I think that we're seeing women in much more, um, in a different light than we have perhaps uh, 30, 20 years ago, or even I'll say five years ago. 
Yeah, thank you for sharing your experience being the only sort of woman of color in a room. I know being interested in computer science and doing these types of classes, I've been the only girl in the room all too many times. Um, I guess I want to sort of address the quote unquote elephant in the room. We're having a webinar right now. Uh, so I wanted to kind of ask you all sort of what has been the impact of coronavirus on your careers and your jobs? I mean, and I'm speaking for Sloan and I, our proms were canceled and sort of like our senior years don't look the same. Um, but we are, we are very glad for the health and safety of our families. Um, I just wanted to open it up to Julia. Could you talk a bit about sort of your experience with coronavirus? Yes, I'd be happy to. Um, and I will apologize if you can hear any background noise. I do have the door closed. Um, but my son is home and part of video games or COVID is that we play a lot of video games once our homework is done. <laughs> and that can get a lot of noisy. Um, how people buy and sell residential real estate has absolutely changed. Uh, I discovered back in March, I just sat down, had a long think with myself that the landscape was changing. We were shut down in New York City and we're going to be. And I thought, well, how am I going to communicate with people? How am I going to tell the story of a home? I'm so used to being able to meet with people at open houses on Sunday and connect with them. And remember, my superpower is listening. 30 seconds, I can listen to you and understand exactly what you're trying to do. And without that, I was like, I don't know how I'm going to connect with people. So then I took this thing and I started doing video. And then I got myself a gimbal and I taught myself how to make videos. And then I taught myself how to edit videos. Uh, and then I got myself all the equipment set up that I have around my computer today so that I could constantly be doing these calls. And so now when I'm onboarding a customer, we're on a Zoom call so that I can see their body language, so I can see their facial expressions. And so I can understand when I'm saying something that resonates or doesn't resonate with them. Um, and then I can do a better job of helping them find that property. And then on the flip side, when I'm selling, now I'm creating these videos and I'm, I'm really figuring out like, what is the story here? How do I connect and tell a story through the pictures? Um, so it's been very interesting. We've been back open since June and I can see that people only come out and look if they really want to. I feel like all of that has given us more time. I spend more time with my family than I did before. Um, I spend more time resting. I, I'm not running around as much. I have the five pounds to prove it. Uh, but the real beauty of that not running around is it just helps me relax and, and think more deeply about what it is I'm doing in the world, what I wanna be doing in the world. And I think as you get older in your career, uh, Gozi touched on this, you, you want to give back. That becomes really, really important to you. You spend all this time creating all this success. You have all this experience. You, you have all these insights. And all you really want to do is turn around and share it with the world. And so I'm sharing it with the world through my videos. If you look at my Instagram page, you can see lots of fun videos. So that's what's changed for me. Nicole, would you like to touch on that question about how COVID has changed your life? Sure, yeah. I mean, for me, it's uh, been pretty much my entire focus of my job um, since since March. And I wrote my first article about a new virus that emerged in China on January 21st. So um, it's been a long time. Um, and, you know, it's it's it is very can be very overwhelming to spend all of your time immersed in something that is, you know, also something that impacts you kind of personally and in, in your life. Like I was like everyone dealing with um, the impacts of, of shutdowns and, you know, what was like figuring out what was going on and how to keep myself safe and, and what I needed to know while also processing that information in order to write about it for kind of the Verge's audience at the same time. Um, so it was definitely like a, a an overwhelming few months as that sort of got settled um, and made me um, 
have to be more thoughtful than I usually am about protecting myself and, you know, my mental health through my work. Um, because, you know, there's a lot of very real, um, like stress and anxiety that comes from, um, spending all of your time thinking about something that is deadly and destructive. And that is like, causing a lot of suffering for a lot of people. So just figuring out how to establish those, those boundaries for myself, um, was really important. Um, and you know, but it also, the, the, this has been, um, a time for me to, to kind of improve, like my work is very, like, I, it's very important that I get everything right. And that I am on top of the stories I need to be on top of. And that I'm telling the stories of the people who, who deserve to have their stories told and um, illuminating um, like inequities in what's going on in the pandemic that, that I think are important and keeping pace with kind of the, the constant changes. Um, and I'm grateful to be able to, to do that work um, at the same time that, you know, it, it, it is, you know, it's hard. It's really hard. Um. Thank you. Uh, those are probably a bit um, more drastic changes than having prom canceled, but um, uh, that was important to us too. Um, for the next question, kind of to put you guys on the spot a little bit, is there a message or a quote that has really stuck with you and you kind of think to it um, when you need a little bit of a push? I know for me, there's an Abraham Lincoln quote where he said, you never fail unless you quit. And I think about that a lot when I lose election after election. I'm just thinking about <laughs> how he lost a lot, too. Um, I know Risha has a quote, too. Risha, do you want to share? Yeah, I mean, I, I didn't really have a quote, per se, that, that I lived by. Um, but it's something that sort of my mom has instilled in me of just doing the next, like, thing, like, focusing on what you're working on right now. And, like, don't look too far ahead because then you'll get like stuck in the clouds. And I, and I think there's this quote from like Frozen 2 that like is perfect for it. It's like, do the next right thing. And that kind of, I try to use that, especially in high school uh, where, you know, assignments can get very stressful very quickly. So does anybody else have some sort of like quote or message that they, they love? So um, for me, um, and this goes along the lines of what we talked about, being that we, um, you know, in our daily lives and in our work lives, we encounter challenging situations um, or, you know, we get into situations where we are nervous or we, uh, we are getting into um, situations that could be difficult. Um, and so for me, I, I try to remember that the people that came before me, my mom, my grandmothers, my great grandmothers, my aunts, they've all gone through very challenging situations and probably more challenging than I have gone through or I would ever go through. And I always say, you know what? They are, I imagine them behind me and I always say, you know what? They've been through it. If they can do it, I can do it. And so um, I always imagine myself when I walk into very difficult situations, my mom behind me, my aunts, my grandmother, everyone behind me. And honestly, it gives me a sense of strength and I typically just push through. Um, thank you, Ngozi. Uh, uh, I have one. <laughs> <laughs> um, similar to, to Risha, I take, um, and, and Ngozi as well, um, I take uh, words from my mom. Um, every, every time that I encounter a challenge, querer es poder. And in Spanish, that's, you know, where there's a will, there's a way. You're encountering a problem, you're encountering a challenge. Just because you haven't figured out a way to solve it yet doesn't mean there isn't. Um, and you know, there, there, are, there is a way out there, you just have to find it and persevere until you do. Thank you. Um, so, so I want to remind everyone to, if you have any questions, um, just toss them in the Q&A box or button. And um, so I'll start one here from Miss Clark. Um, she's asking Erica, you've been in a variety of countries with very different histories and cultures. What are the aspects in your educational journey or real world experiences um, have contributed most to your ability to make a positive impact in your assignment in each country? That's a Hi, bit of a Clark. question. <laughs> 
it is so nice to hear from you. Oh, um, I think the kind of like like Julia, the ability to to listen um, and to appreciate where other people are coming from, um, because India is very different than Brazil, which is very different from Belgium, um, but they're all like wonderful, fascinating places. And um, you, you know, when I was there, I, I got to know the locals and I immersed myself. Um, and I came back with, you know, this real deep appreciation and love for, for these other cultures. And I think you can tell I get very excited about this. So obviously this is, you know, the right path for me to be on. Um, but I think, even at, at Kingswood, you know, just the excitement of learning something new. And now as an adult, I still have that excitement. It's just, you know, I have opportunities to learn new things uh, overseas. So um, another question that we've gotten is from Meryl Mandel. Some of you have talked about sort of changing courses in your professional work. Other than going back to school or changing course while in school, how would you recommend changing course in your work life? Maybe Julia, I think you yes, I'll, I'll hop into that because sometimes opportunities will present themselves. Um, and opportunities don't come dressed up with bows and whistles. You have to really keep your eyes open. So when I moved back to New York City from Hong Kong, I actually went into the fashion industry. I didn't really know what I wanted to do and I love clothes, so why not? And I got myself a job and I was working for Ralph Lauren in sales and that division got shut down and I was out of a job. And I had been organizing a group of gals to go out to the Hamptons every weekend and putting together parties and cookouts and whatnot. And one of the gals in the house was a real estate broker. And she said, you know, I think you'd be good at real estate. 24 hours after I lost my job. And I was like, oh, okay, I'll give it a try. I, you know, I didn't know what else to do. And so I just jumped in. I didn't do any analysis on what, what it's like to be a real estate broker. I did zero analysis on anything. I just followed my gut instinct and said, I think this is going to work. Lo and behold, it did really, really well. So sometimes you just have to take a leap of faith. Like you just, um, so Ngozi, I mean, you talked a little bit about your switch from pre-med to IT, sort of what, what inspired you to, to follow IT? Well, quite frankly, um, I didn't know much about IT when I switched IT, to be quite frank with you. Um, like I mentioned, you know, I had been, you know, throughout my life, I had been pretty much intent on going to medical school. Um, and so, um, when I decided not to go to medical school anymore, um, I, I had to make a decision. I mean, my parents are pretty much one of those, you know, so what are you doing type thing? And so um, I knew that I was under a lot of pressure to graduate in four years, quite frankly. And um, I knew I had an interest in business. Uh, at UConn, the IT, the IT um, the, um, school sits in the School of Business. And so literally I went to the guidance counselor's office and I looked through all the majors and I saw IT and I said, you know what, that looks interesting. I'll give it a shot. And I made some meetings with um, the Dean of the School of Business and some of some professors at the time. And I talked to them, you know, I think that, you know, we have to get comfortable with talking to people and they were very encouraging. They said, it goes to give it a shot, you know, do this, do that, do that. And literally within a week, I put together my application and submitted it. And um, like Julia said, sometimes you just have to jump into it and I did it I you know I jumped into it I'm not quite sure what I was signing up for but um it turned out to be something great I you know went on to get my MBA also from UConn and spent 22 years in that field um and so sometimes you just have to um jump in but I'll say you know it, it, it does help to do research I mean we have resources I mean in, back in I don't know 25 years ago we used to have binders of majors, right? I don't know, Julie, if I remember those, right? You go to the career services office, there are binders of majors. But now you can go on the internet, you can talk to people, you can have meetings. So, you know, do that and don't be, don't be scared. 
you know, nothing, my mom always, nothing is permanent. You could always switch back. You know, if, if you try something, you don't like it, you could always do something else. And so um, just jump in and, and knowing that all majors are and fields are very diverse. You know, when you think of IT, you can do networking, you can do computer programming, you can do implementations. It, it's so broad nowadays that even if you, you don't like a particular section, there could be other areas that you can find very interesting. Yeah, I have, I have a quick follow up to that. So I, I know you've talked a little bit about being a minority in your career. What is your advice to, to students interested in pursuing IT? I mean, uh, Ms. Clark has asked that specifically. Uh, she said that she's the AP coordinator. And except for the year that I was taking AP computer science, the males enrolled in the course vastly outnumber the females. So sort of what is your advice for, for students interested in, in computer science or or more technical skills like that? First of all, I'll say do it. Just do it, right? Um, most likely you'll be the only female there or one of a handful of females there. That's fine. You know, you know, you, you've got it. You know, hold your own in class. Um, it can be lonely, quite frankly. I, and I have to be honest with you, it can be very lonely. And sometimes, um, you know, we get into this thing called imposter syndrome. Um, but try to find alliances, talk to your professors. You know, if there are women in the women professors or women faculty, reach out to them and talk, talk to them because they know what you're going through. Um, if there are staff that are females, reach out to them, talk to them, find a support network. But by all means, do it, you know, and you will struggle. You will struggle because sometimes we get into our own heads. Hang in there if that's what you want to do. Push forward, do it. But seriously, um, if you can get a support network around you, faculty, staff, your peers, get, I call them your angels, get your angels around you, people who can support you through, through um, challenges. Thank you um, so much. That's actually a great segue into our next question, which comes from Ms. Sarbeck, who's our fantastic new Dean of Students. Um, she was actually just featured in our last KO Power Women newsletter. Um, so thank you for your question, Ms. Sarbeck. She asks, how important or valuable to your success have partnerships, allyships, mentorships in your, in your professional career? And how do you end a relationship when you discover that that partnership is no longer beneficial? Um, and she would also like to say, hi, Nicole. She was a, a Bowdoin grad class in 1998. <laughs> so um, does anyone, uh, maybe I'll give it to Julia. Have you ever had a relationship that you found was no longer beneficial or a partnership? So what's interesting is that, first of all, I think you know, we've all talked about this already, whether it be your angels or your mentor or just learning from your peers, you, you have to have collaboration in order to succeed in life. Interestingly enough, very recently, um, I connected with a woman and she was really, really intent on forming a professional relationship with me where we would give each other referrals, introduce, um, she wanted to introduce people to me and she wanted me to introduce her to the people I knew. And her head was in the right place, but it became very apparent that I was talking to her that for me, her heart wasn't in the right place. She, she didn't ring through as someone who was authentically caring. She, it was, it was for her. It was more of a numbers game. I'm going to introduce you to like ten people. You introduce me to your ten people, and I thought that doesn't fit how I operate my business and my life. And that's fine uh, if that works for her. But I just sort of gently backed away. And I was like, no, people who are in my network, they're quality, they're caring, they're genuine, they're professional. They're not just trying to climb on your back to get ahead. That's not how I operate. So I think you have to be aware when you are building your circle uh, that your values are aligned. And then just sort of gently disassociate yourself with a smile on your face and go the other way. Alrighty, so we have another question from the Q&A. Uh, Wendy Reynolds, who is a KO parent, uh, and she asks, Nicole, what are some of the challenges you have faced as a woman in journalism? Do you think that the profession is receptive to females or women in the field? Yeah, so it's interesting. I think that um, for me, 
and in my experience, I've been fairly lucky with, you know, bosses and like the, the areas I've worked in and, you know, a lot of the challenges are not gender specific, but just freelance journalism in the field is like a little bit inherently exploitative and you have to kind of navigate a lot of that um, kind of bigger picture systems level stuff is um, kind of as the top line challenge, I would say. Um, but in terms of, you know, gender dynamics, I think that the one of the main challenges or the thing that I've noticed a lot is, you know, a lot of my work is talking to sources, talking to experts. I spend a lot of time, you know, emailing and, and on the phone with, um, you know, a lot of scientists. Um, and you, the sometimes can get, you know, inappropriate or creepy, you know, not necessarily crossing a line, but like, you'll feel a little weird about the way that someone responds to your email. And it's like, what is like really going on here is like, this is kind of uncomfortable. Um, and that's something that you just sort of like, is just, is there a lot, um, you know, a lot of the uh, work in journalism sort of almost requires that you spend a lot of time on Twitter. It's a big part of how people communicate and talk to each other. And, you know, I'm not quite at the level in terms of following where I get a lot of abuse, um, but most women who have a significant following on Twitter get take a lot of abuse um, and have to be really careful about um, like things like doxing where people will, you know, find personal information about you and, you know, call your phone or show up at your house and sort of the, the scariest outlier. Um, particularly, you know, I work in um, adjacent to tech journalism and tech journalism is some of the, takes some of the, the female reporters take a lot of abuse from, you know, right wing Nazis on the internet. Um, and that can be really, really scary. Um, and, you know, for the most part, I think that people, you know, peers and others in, in the industry are, you know, very supportive and things like that. But there, you know, can, you do see sometimes the sort of like, oh, it can't be that bad, is it? And, you know, it, for a lot of people, it really, really is that bad. So this is not, <laughs> uh, it's an incredibly important area of work. And I have so much respect for the women and men who report on um, these sort of extremist areas of the internet. But um, I think that's something that you always think about um, when, or I, I think about kind of not infrequently. Thank you, um, Nicole. I'll give this next question to Julia since you just mentioned her son in the other room. Um, I, I hate to ask this question because you never really hear it asked of men, but do you struggle with maintaining a balance between your professional and your personal lives? Um, like I mentioned, some of you are mothers. That obviously requires a lot of work. Um, how do you manage full lives so successfully and, you know, balancing your social life, your family life with your, with your career? Wow, that could be a whole seminar. Thanks, Sloan. <laughs> uh, I, I think the truth is all human beings, men and women, struggle with that balance and nobody ever achieves a perfect balance. Uh, there are times in your life where you're devoting more time to one area than another. You really just have to organize your time around your priorities. You know, what are the top three, four, five things you're trying to do uh, at any one given time? And then you sort of organize around that. And when you're a mother, all mothers will tell you, every stage is different. You're in, every child is different. and there's also swings in your careers. There's times when I've had to work a whole lot. And then there's times where I suddenly find there's a lot of white space in my calendar. Um, so flexibility, adaptability, and then, you know, planning for, for example, every Sunday night at 6 p.m., I know I'm sitting down for a family dinner. And that's when we're talking about the week. That's when we're figuring out what, what their issues or what we have to do differently. And so when you have those sort of markers in your calendars of like, this is when I know family dinner is. This is when I know I get on my Peloton. And you have sort of non-negotiables around your goals. Uh, that's how you keep some semblance of normality. Um, and Nicosia, oh yeah, Erica, go ahead. The Foreign Service is kind of special um, because you take your family with you wherever you go. So it, 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 there's very, you know, there's definitely a connection between family life and work life um, in the in the foreign service. Um, so people, you know, people with families 
they travel with them. They go to school, you know, the kids go to school in, in those countries. And when you're looking at new positions in new embassies, you have to take that into account. Um, the, I think the hard thing for uh, people like me who are single is that our families stay in the U.S. So, you know, I see my, when I'm overseas, I see my parents maybe once, twice a year if I'm lucky. Um, a lot of it is video calls. Um, so that's definitely a consideration. Um, it's, just, it's, it's just a very unique situation. I think maybe the military is the only comparison I can make. Yeah, and so um, for me, I'll say that um, being a working mom is, is very challenging, you know. Um, and so um, your choice of spouse becomes very important, you know. Um, you know, if you plan to have a family, you know, a man, you know, um, you know, um, to do parents and kids, um, I think that you want to make sure that your spouse is supportive as much as you support. In my case, my husband you know, also ensure that my husband is also supportive of me. And so as we get older, as you guys get older, you're making decisions based on your future spouses, you know, you know, think about that. You want a spouse that will be supportive of your career ambitions. And now having said that also, um, there was a period of my uh, career where I devoted um, five years to staying home with my children. That was also really hard. You know, um, staying home was also probably one of the hardest jobs I've ever done. And also in that situation as well, it was also important to have a supportive spouse. But uh, like Julia said, you know, um, you know, life ebbs and flows. You know, um, being a parent is very challenging at times and not quite, in, and not so challenging at other times. And things are very fluid. And so, you know, you try to cover out time to have family time. You try to um, cover out time to have career time. And, and sometimes realistically, um, you and your spouse, at least I am my spouse, my husband, we take turns, you know, um, there are times when my career is high pitch and, you know, he takes a bit of a backseat and there are other times when his career is super high gear and I take a backseat and I support him. Um, it, it's really hard to have, you know, have it all at the same time. I, I, I haven't found a way to do it. I think, I, I think realistically you can have it all, but you'll have it all at different times of your life. And that's okay. At the end of the day, you have to figure out, what works best for you and your family and your spouse and your children. And, you know, you respond to everyone's needs in the family. I mean, that's what families do. Sometimes, you know, kids need a little bit more, sometimes they need a little bit less. And you find a way to respond effectively to everyone's needs and make it work. I think when you think of your family life in its longevity, you know, over a period of time, it works out well. There are times when everyone will go through bumps. And I usually tell my kids, I'm like, you know what? Today was a rough day. We'll do better tomorrow, you know, and that's just what it is. You know, sometimes, you know, it just, it comes together nicely and all times it just frankly just falls apart and, you know, you just pick up and keep moving and, and, and try to make it work, but it's hard. Thank you all for sharing about your, um, your family lives. I, I want to bring it kind of full circle back to King Kingswood because uh, all of us have sort of a connection to the school. Uh, Nicole, would you um, answer kind of what lessons you've learned at your time at KO and sort of what you took away from your experience in high school? Yeah, um, I mean, I had a, I was like incredibly lucky to go to KO and have wonderful teachers and like great opportunities to um, like learn and grow as a person um, and like a thinker um, and you know, I think that uh, something that was really important to me um, that I got out of KO, you know, I worked for the KO News, which, you know, journalism, obviously, but um, I always think that, I always say that Forensic Union, I think, was the thing that contributed the most to my work um, in journalism because, you know, a lot of debate is thinking critically about dif different issues and like thinking through a lot of sides of, of different issues and understanding how those arguments fit together and play against each other um, and communicating clearly. And, um, you know, those are all skills that were really foundational um, for me and that I built on through kind of college and, and, um, and my early in my career as well. Um, and, 
that sort of curiosity and asking questions and um, wanting to dig into root causes of things that you see in the world. Um, I got a lot of that out of um, my time in Friends of Union. Um, and I think other things I got a lot of KO out of from KO were, you know, I had really good teachers who did not put up with me when I was trying to, you know, be a know-it-all or, you know, thought I was smarter than everyone else and things like that, that, you know, when you're, you know, I was like a, a little bit of an overachiever, I would say. I don't know if any of my old teachers are listening in, probably would be able to confirm. Um, and just having the push to take a step back and say, okay, Nicole, like, think about, you know, what other people are saying around you as well. Um, and um, it's really easy to get caught up um, in kind of how you think about things, um, but having the push to um, think about how other people are, are seeing them as well. Um, I think I got very lucky in having um, really wonderful teachers who kind of pushed me in that respect, um, which I'm very grateful for. Um, and I was also very lucky to play on varsity soccer team for a long time um, for uh, Tracy Dieter, who was wonderful. And I learned a ton from about uh, perseverance, um, working really hard, and also um, that it was okay to ask for help when I needed it. So very grateful for that as well. So I think we have two more questions um, to kind of finish up. And I, I wanna hear everyone's answers, but I'm gonna pose it to Ngozi first. How would you define success and have you achieved that? You're muted, by the way. Um, I'll, I'll say that um, individually, we have to determine what success is for us. Um, and so it varies um, um, based on the person. Um, and for me, success is just happiness. Um, and success is being able to see me happy, my spouse happy, my kids happy, and my family happy. Um, that's really what it is for me. Um, I think every other thing is just that. Every other thing is just fluff. Um, but happiness means, you know, how it comes in different facets, right? Uh, one is being happy in my job, in what I do, and being able to do my job well. That brings me happiness. Um, seeing my kids do well and be happy, you know, um, that also success, that's what success is for me. So there really isn't one definition for success. I think we all get to define what that is. And based on our life circumstance, um, that definitely drives that. Um, but for me at this point in my, and again, you know, at, at this point in my life, what success is to me now is very different from what it was in my thirties and in my twenties. Let me be quite frank with you. So, um, for me today, um, at this point in my life is just, um, is that I'm at peace and I'm happy and I'm content and I'm so much, you know, um, much more relaxed and happy. So that's what it means to me at this point in my life. Anybody else have an answer? Yeah, I can go. Um, for me, uh, professional success, I guess, specifically would be, you know, doing work that I um, think is important um, and find meaningful. Um, and, you know, I feel lucky to be in a line of work that I feel that way about. Um, and, you know, I've always sort of said that I didn't necessarily have like ambition, I don't necessarily want to work for a specific paper or do like specific types of stories, but I want to do work that feels important to me. And I want to write things that I think are important. Um, and I'm, you know, have been able to, to do that in, you know, this year and I've done that in the past and, you know, that's sort of a constant process. It's not something that I think you, I will reach and then it's like, I'm done. I've like done the important work. It's like, that's a, I want to be in a position where I'm able to continue to do that work that I think is important. Um, and kind of on the personal, quasi professional side, it's, um, success is having a good work-life balance. Um, I think that in journalism, there's a lot of, it's very easy to make your work, your personality, um, and your whole life. And I 
don't want that to be um, like, I want to be able to step outside of that and kind of be my own person and have my own kind of life and goals and things like that outside of the bounds of kind of what that means. Um, And, you know, that's easier sometimes than others. Um, I don't, not anywhere near perfect in any of that. I don't think anyone is, Um, but that's something that I, I think I I strive for as well. Similarly, um, like Nicole, I think success is a, it's a journey. It's a process. It's not necessarily a destination. Um, And for me, it's focusing on where I am, whatever embassy I am in, um, and trying to do the most good where I am at the moment. And, you know, hopefully that adds up over time. And when I look back on it, I'll be able to see you know, the things that I have done. Uh, but it, it's not, I, I never feel like I attain success. I think it's just it's every step of the way celebrating the, the little successes you have. I'd like to add a little bit to that. Um, and I'm taking myself back to being a senior at KO back in 1981 before any of you were born and I'm remembering that you know you had to have a certain grade point average you have to get certain marks on your SATs did you take this AP course but you know you're, that's exactly where your heads are right now because you're like okay then I can get into that school if I get in that school maybe I can go to that grad school if I go to that grad school then I can get the job here and then I can make this amount of money and then I'm going to live there and this is who I'm going to marry and like we, we have these scenarios in our head because that's just who we are we like to think about the future and, and dream And it's really easy. And and this happened to a lot of women in my generation. And and I find that you all are just much more authentic and in tune. But there were a lot of women who were capable of driving themselves to the point where they checked all the boxes and they, they got that big job in finance and they woke up one day and they're a managing director and they are miserable because it didn't ring true with their authentic gifts and their voice. So as you are creating this career and you're creating your success, which is really about giving your best every day and living in a wholehearted manner, you have to keep checking in to say, is this work resonating with me? And if it's not, pivot. If it's not, don't be afraid to change. Don't be afraid to try something new, but do work that makes you feel good about yourself and you will be successful. Fantastic. Thank you so much. And um, we're approaching the end of our time here. I feel like we could keep talking for another hour. Um, but just to, for our last question here, just in a couple words, could all of you just kind of give your advice to all the young women watching this, um, watching this webinar during these difficult times, just in just a few words, what, what's your main piece of advice? Reach out. Hang in there. Get involved. Yeah, I think just with the, it comes from the previous question, but success isn't a destination, it's a process. On that note, um, we are going to conclude our 2020 Power of Women Forum. Thank you all so much for joining us, all, all of the participants, and thank you to the panelists. Um, And thank you for joining us and helping us to ignite tomorrow's leaders. We want to thank everyone who made this event possible. First, our incredible panelists. You are fantastic representatives for Kingswood Oxford, and we're so grateful to be able to learn from your experience and success. Next, um, a quick shout out to our executive board members, Emma Levenbo, Catherine Dorr, Olivia Reynolds, and Maddie Thiessen, and our entire student committee for their hard work helping us create um, this forum. And we would also like to say thank you to Mr. Dillo and all of the KO administration for their constant support. And finally, Mrs. Rotter, she's one of the most hardworking and dedicated women we know. I know I speak on behalf of Sloan and myself when I say she's one of my inspirations and I've learned so much from her. So um, sort of to end it off, please check out our new um, website. I'm putting it in the chat for everyone to see. Uh, And here you can see Uh, more information about our upcoming events and um, we'll be posting the the recorded uh, webinar on there as well. Thank you again and Ms. Rotter, send us out. 
Well, thank you girls, Sloan and Risha, for doing such an amazing job today. And I wanna really thank our panelists for giving us an inspiring and engaging conversation. I know I speak for everyone who has been watching today. Thank you. I think we will all leave here today feeling more empowered as women. I really wanna thank J.B. Wells for his technical ex expertise and my other colleagues, Dina, Elizabeth, Megan, Hope, Francis, and Brenda. Also special thanks to Jackie and Kristen and our communications department and to our co-chairs and all of you for taking the time today and supporting the KO Power of Women. Our students are committed to bringing more great programs in the future. Don't forget to check out next month's newsletter and enjoy this beautiful day. Bye-bye everyone. <laughs>